Hi, my name's Brad Ladwig, and in this video you're going to hear today about some recent work we've done here at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology on the area of machine learning for chemical engineering. First up, you're going to hear from Alexander Strahl about the simulations that we did. Then you'll hear from Matthias Schneevin talking about how we train machine learning models. And finally from Pascal Friedrich, and he will talk about how we can take those machine learning models further. Right now, let's get into it. My name is Alexander Stroh. Uh, I'm a senior scientist at the Institute of Fluid Mechanics. I work on computational fluid dynamics in the field of multiphase flows and also turbulent flows. In this project, uh, we take a look at a, a two-dimensional simulation of a channel flow. And in this channel flow, we introduce structuring or let's say obstacles into the flow. Uh, and we investigate how those obstacles uh, basically affect the mass and heat transfer in such a channel. Right, so for this investigation, we're basically using a direct numerical simulation. A direct numerical simulation is a high fidelity simulation which resolves all the scales of the flow in spatial and uh, temporal sense. So basically, uh, we uh, resolve uh, the smallest and the biggest scales uh, in the flow. Uh, that's why direct numerical simulation uh, can be a pretty expensive simulation uh, due to the fact that we need uh, high resolution to resolve those scales. For introduction of the uh, structuring in the channel flow, uh, we use immersed boundary method. Immersed boundary method basically uh, tries to reduce the velocity in single points of the simulation to zero and by doing that we basically simulate a certain structure uh, which we want to introduce there. So the code we're using is called Simpson. Uh, this is a spectral code written in Fortran and the main advantage of the code that we can uh, use uh, this periodicity we have in the domain and uh, introduce fast Fourier transform which basically reduces uh, the amount of computations we need uh, to uh, uh, compute the flow field. You need around 20 minutes of computational time on a normal desktop uh, to carry out a simulation like that. And uh, for our study, since we need uh, more than 10,000 simulations, uh, we would probably need uh, around two years on a single machine to carry out all of them. That's why we basically had to move to a high performance computing center here at KIT and carry out uh, those simulations there. What we can see here is, is the mesh of our simulation. We have uh, 384 uh, points in the streamwise direction and uh, 129 points in the uh, wall normal direction. So now we see the temperature distribution uh, in the channel. So we have a flow f flowing through the structure and we have a high temperature wall on the top and the bottom, uh, on the bottom we have the low temperature wall. Uh, we can also take a look at the streamlines of our flow and uh, as you can see here we have uh, recirculation zones uh, in, the, uh, in the areas between these hills so to say and uh, you can also observe that uh, these recirculation zones affect the temperature uh, which we can uh, take a look at here so you see here uh, like a more blue region uh, it means that we basically modify the temperature gradients in the system and we uh, modify the heat transfer in the system. The most important parameters in, in this system uh, are the uh, drag coefficient which basically represents uh, the pumping power you need uh, to drive the flow through uh, such a structured channel and uh, also the Stanton number which basically describes the uh, heat transfer efficiency in such a system. And based on this simulation, we can extract the drag coefficient and the Stanton number based on the structuring we're introduced here. I'm Matthias Schneewind. I'm a computer scientist and PhD student at um, the IMAT group at the KIT. In this study, we wanted to predict flow properties of a 2D channel um, with a machine learning model to discover basically new channels. And for this it was really important to uh, 
add as little human bias to the primary generation of uh, structures of those um, flow channels to have a machine learning model that can generalize in a big space of different um, wall geometries, basically. And we did this with random walks, uh, so to say, have a random path, uh, which you then can smoothen out by spline interpolation. And that gave us wide varieties of channel structures from very rough ones with only a few points and very small kings up to very noisy and fine-grained structures so that the machine learning model has a wide variety to learn from and then hopefully can generate new channel structures or at least predict for a large variety of new channel structures what their flow properties might be. For the machine learning model, we start with an image representation of the channel. Um, this is a 2D image and it has the wall structure in whatever shape you might want it to be. And it consists of um, pixels basically. And this then we want to use to predict two output properties which should end up around here which is basically the Stanton number and the drag coefficient. And to get from an image representation to this simple two regression properties, uh, you first try to reduce the size of the image. So what a convolutional network does, it takes just segments of this image and looks at those segments at once. And it has kernels that basically move over this image representation and aggregate the information or extract features from those little chunks of image data. And the nice thing about this is that you, instead of really learning a fully connected layer, so having weights for each and every pixel, you just learn this kernel representation and can learn several different um, feature extractors, basically, or feature maps. And so we basically start with these kernels, which then generate a whole number of um, different features from this image. Um, so it could be that one encodes especially for a specific curve um, or just different angles of the wall geometry. And um, we can then again work on each of those newly generated images uh, we get when we shift those kernels over this whole picture and we can do this layer by layer. So we have another layer that again generates little pieces, um, little feature maps and in the end we just concatenate all those output pixels to one representation which, which is basically one vector of as a latent representation. And um, from here on, we know what to do, which is basically training a multilayer perceptron, uh, which can basically then do the regression tasks. So we can use, for example, one intermediate step um, to then get to the Stanton number and one intermediate step to get to the drag coefficient. In this plot, you see um, the distribution in our data amongst the drag coefficient and the Stanton number. So the drag coefficient is on the x-axis and the Stanton number on the y-axis. What we want to achieve is to have channels which have a really low drag coefficient but a high heat transfer, so a large Stanton number. And as you can see, and the, the training data really distributes across this plot more or less. Um, and when we hover over those black dots, our training data, you can see that there's a really large variety from um, very, yeah, more smooth channels to more noisy channels, from symmetric to unsymmetric channels, and um, from really strange, let's say, wall geometries um, to more uh, 
flat ones, for example, or smoothed out ones. Um, so our model in the end has a really large variety of different wall structures to learn from and then also to extrapolate. So what we did in the next step um, was to generate a new set of structures which was five times as much as the training data. And we could then um, predict the new values for drag coefficient and Stanton number for those newly generated, randomly generated structures. And what you can see here are some selected structures from this data set and their predictions. And those are marked by those blue triangles. And if we go to those, we can see um, that we get structures that basically have like a bump in the middle. This one has this, but this one also, those ones also have this. And um, this is actually quite intuitive. So by having this curvature in the channel, we increase the uh, surface of the wall so we can transmit more heat. But on the other hand, as this is a really smooth curvature in the end, um, we get a low drag coefficient. And this is how we could optimize the general geometry by using a machine learning model for high throughput discovery. Hi, I'm Pascal. I'm a junior professor at KIT, uh, working on uh, method development for AI methods uh, for material science. My background is in physics. And in the last few years, I moved more and more towards uh, developing new machine learning methods to solve problems in, in natural sciences, especially in material science. We can extend the methods that we uh, just discussed, going, for example, towards uh, 3D simulations of uh, a flow in three-dimensional structures. They can be much, much more complicated than just a single channel. There can be multiple channels that are connected to each other. Most machine learning models are trained in a quite sequential way. So we first start with generating a lot of input data that we can use to train the machine learning models on. Then we train the machine learning models, uh, look at their accuracy in predicting uh, uh, the uh, outcome of, of a, a holdback uh, test set. And then we use the trained model in order to do predictions, design new structures and so on. But there's a much better way to, and a more efficient way to use machine learning models. And that is much more iterative. So we not only generate data once in the beginning, but we use the first bit of data that we get from initial simulations, from some experiments, train initial machine learning models, and then use these machine learning models in order to predict what would be the next most informative experiment or simulation to do. So we kind of um, implement the feedback loop between experiments or simulations that generate new data that's reliable, feed that into machine learning models, train the models, and then ask the models what's the next data point that you would need in order to improve yourself. And then we start an iterative loop. The machine learning model predicts new data points that would be very informative to improve its performance. And we run new experiments, we run new simulations to gather that data and then feed it back to the machine learning model, retrain the model um, in order to get a higher performance. And by running these iterations, by uh, sequentially improving the model, we can explore the possible design space in a much more efficient way uh, and find much nicer designs, much better improving uh, 3D structures or 2D structures for uh, chemical engineering than in a very uh, uh, sequential classical way. So machine learning models applied to challenges in natural sciences, uh, we have three things to consider. First, we have a problem or a challenge of heterogeneity of data. So we don't have massive amounts of data as we usually have in, for example, computer vision problems. Um, the second thing is the interpretability of models. So we not only want to have good predictions, but we also want to have predictions that we can understand. So we want to look inside of the model and think and uh, understand what the model thinks. And the third thing is the uncertainty quantification. So it really depends uh, how reliable the model is in the end when we want to apply to real experiments. So we need ways to quantify the uncertainty. And there's ways, for example, transfer learning uh, to tackle the first challenge, the heterogeneity of data. So for example, if we have multiple methods like the direct numerical simulations that we have here uh, and also experiments, uh, we can basically transfer 
um, what we learned before on large amounts of data to these fewer amounts of data points that we can acquire using more complicated uh, techniques. And we can therefore get reliable and accurate machine learning models also uh, trained on very few data points. When it comes to interpretability, uh, there's many methods uh, being developed currently that basically open the black box of neural networks and look into what is actually going on to better understand what the, the neural network is thinking or what the neural network is uh, looking at. For example, in, in particular, when it comes to 2D or 3D structure, uh, all these models are developed for computer vision problems. And when we want to classify, for example, images, we want not only to get an answer, but we want to know what is it in the image or in the input structure um, that the neural network was looking at when it did a certain uh, prediction. And that will us as human researchers help a lot in getting a better understand, understanding of large amounts of data and in the end um, making uh, or, or hypothesizing about new rules, uh, how to uh, predict and design new structures. And the third thing, the uncertainty quantification is also a field of very active research. We can uh, borrow a lot of techniques uh, being developed for Bayesian statistics um, that make not only a prediction for our machine learning models, but also give us an uncertainty associated with that prediction. So we really know when the machine learning model is now doing predictions on an input sample where it's very sure about, because it's probably very similar to something it's seen before, or whether the uncertainty is high, because it's now generalizing or extrapolating away from the um, uh, input uh, data that we train it on, um, and then the uncertainty gets higher, so we again, uh, might want to use that data point to re-evaluate the real performance using an experiment or simulation uh, in order to improve the accuracy. So we have heard now from Alexander Stroll talking about the direct numerical simulations and showing in great detail how we can take the output of those simulations to calculate these important parameters, the Stanton number and the uh, drag coefficient. You have heard Matthias Schneeven talk about the, the detailed way in which the machine learning models were trained and how that was able to give us many new predictions of flow channel structures that would um, ideally <clears throat> have good heat transfer and flow properties. And finally, you've heard in a wide ranging way from Pascal Friedrich as he talks about the incredible potential for machine learning to be used in chemical engineering to give us uh, creative designs for new structures for reactors and flow devices. I would like to say thank you to the uh, financial support that enabled us to do this project, in particular here at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and to the state of Baden-Württemberg for their financial support for the high performance computing facilities here. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Of course, uh, all of this work has been described in our preprint, which is available from Archive. I'd encourage you to have a look at that, but we are aiming to do much more work in this area. So please keep an eye out for our further work.